evening. I'm Derek Fildebrandt, publisher of the Western Standard, and you're watching The Pipeline. Today is January 25th, 2023, and a very good evening to you all. I am joined, as usual, by Western Standard opinion editor, Nigel Hanford. How are you, Nigel? Good today, thank you. I know you're working on some good projects, but I guess we have to keep that hush for now. We can't say anything right now. Okay. Uh, also joined, not as usual, uh, because the great Corey Morgan is uh, down somewhere warmer for the time being, but kind of a flashback to uh, one of the uh, founding panel members of the Pipeline, Western Center News Editor Dave Naylor. How are you, Dave? I'm great, Derek. Glad to be here. Beautiful. Yeah, we had a funny uh, moment the other day. Uh, I saw on Facebook you had this picture up, and you had no hair. It just buzzed, and everyone was in the comment section saying you look like Heisenberg. I thought, no. like, you know, maybe to make a little money on the side of the standard, you're, you're running a crystal meth lab. You came into work the next day, and... You didn't have your hair head shaved. It was just a, a filter, I guess, you had on. Yeah, it was a Snapchat filter. A friend took it, and I put it up. And I can't believe how many people thought it was real. It looked pretty realistic. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, anyway, so for the record, Dave is not uh, cooking crystal meth in his basement. No. But, uh, I'm afraid what my skull looks like when there's no hair on it. At least I don't think you're cooking crystal meth. No, okay. definitely not. Okay. Um, we got an interesting show today. Um the controversy around Danielle Smith and uh, seeking pardons and whatnot for uh, people who were uh, persecuted by the Alberta provincial government uh, while Kenny was in power uh, <clears throat> continues. Uh, you know, it's, it's a combination of a few things. There's around pardons and then there's around alleged interference with prosecutors. Those are two very different things. And uh, you know, the CBC has been putting out stories without evidence, but they're standing by it. So it's in a weird limbo where they're claiming that people have claimed to see emails that would lead to interference and prosecution. CBC hasn't seen the emails. Story continues to evolve and become quite controversial. We're going to uh, we're going to dive into that. Uh, less controversial is uh, numbers around uh, fundraising, uh, preparing for the next provincial election in Alberta. Uh, after several years of lagging behind the NDP, uh, the UCP have now uh, either matched the NDP or arguably, depending on how you're slicing the numbers, gotten ahead of the NDP, both raising $7 million in 2022 uh, in the unofficial numbers so far. Uh, but if you include leadership, uh, fundraising from the leadership campaigns for the UCP, uh, the, ND the UCP would have a significant lead at $10.8 So we're going to talk about that what this means for uh, the United Conservative Party and both of the parties as we go into the provincial election. Um, unsurprisingly, subsidizing uh, the federal government subsidizing the media is not doing enough to stem the bleeding. Post Media, the biggest newspaper company in the country by far, laying off 11% of their editorial workforce, uh, scrapping a bunch of their print copies, which is probably actually a smart move, and uh, moving to remote offices in virtually every newspaper across the country. Um, so uh, damning stuff, the federal government's media bellowed, still not enough money for big media, laying off reporters, shutting down newsrooms right across the country. Before we get started, though, we got to thank, as usual, my favorite sponsor, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. I know you're sick of hearing me say it, but I, I've been a member of the CSSA for more than a decade because they are Canada's leading firearms rights group. Without the CSSA, the federal government would have likely confiscated uh, all of our firearms a long time ago by this point. Uh, membership of the CSSA is vital to ensure that there is an organization speaking for firearms owners in Canada to educate people and to fight the federal government where necessary um, uh, against uh, ridiculous and arbitrary firearm seizures and limitations about what law-abiding people can do with uh, with their firearms. So if you're not yet a member of the CSSA, make sure you go to cssa-cila.org or just Google CSSA as I do and become a member today. It's vital for firearms owners to stand together. That's why I've been a member for so long. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, the controversy around Alberta Premier Danielle Smith. Um, toot our own horn a little bit, this actually started in an interview we did with Danielle Smith uh, during their convention, uh, the party's first convention, right after she was elected uh, leader of the party and uh, made premier, um, I was asked. I asked her about pardons for people who are facing uh, at least provincial charges, not federal charges, provincial charges, 
uh, involving COVID. People who refused to shut their restaurants down, wouldn't close their churches down. People who got a, were charged for, uh, you know, Calgary police beat the crap out of a kid for playing uh, pond hockey. All sorts of ridiculous things. And I asked her about pardons for this. And uh, I don't know, put words in her mouth, but uh, was long, her response was along the lines of, yeah, that's something we should absolutely be looking at. Uh, she couldn't speak to the specifics of it, what powers the province has, and what it doesn't. Pardons are one thing, because you know, you, it wouldn't be favoritism. It would just say this was an inappropriate application of the law. The province overstepped its bounds and shouldn't have been bringing in these restrictions anyway. Um, and so there'd just be a blanket pardon for people who didn't actually do anything violent or damage property, that kind of thing. Um, but the story took a bit of a twist, uh, I think, last week when the CBC claimed that uh, people, uh, they had seen, they, they have talked to people in Smith's office who have seen emails between the Premier's office and prosecutors uh, that would show some kind of interference with prosecutorial independence. That'd be an issue. Dave, why, why don't you fill in the blanks there? Well, after that CBC story came out, obviously it exploded because if true, it's a huge, huge problem. It's a huge scandal. Uh, you cannot have the premier or politicians interfering in the judicial system. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the UCP or Daniel Smith brought in a, uh, the public service to go through all their emails over the weekend, and they couldn't find any. And they said, uh, that's it, story done and dusted. Uh, so uh, threw the ball back into the CBC's court. Uh, they put out a, or they updated their story to say they stand by it. And uh, they were, didn't take it down. So, but as of uh, a few minutes ago, CBC appears to have doubled down and brought in another story saying, uh, uh, after the election, or sorry, after she won the leadership, that Danielle Smith visited the justice uh, minister and, and spoke about this stuff. Uh, which, to me, I think you would do, right? I mean, you just you're looking at it as an education experience. Okay, what well, she told me in an interview, yeah. she would do that. Yeah, I, I'm well, not sure how this is uh, what, what's going on now. Yeah. But C and then CBC took it from there to say, uh, uh, you know, she, she became, you know, very pushy in, in wanting to get the, this stuff done. Uh, we've got a call into the premier's office. Uh, it'll be on the site uh, uh, shortly that, uh, uh, that, that is denying it, saying that nothing, uh, nothing unprofessional happened. The justice minister has put out a similar statement. And I think the key thing to remember is the statement from the Crown Prosecutor's Office themselves, who said they had not been in touch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, CBC's doubling down, still no proof, still no named uh, sources, which is fine. That's what journalists do. But uh, it's going to be a still, still a, bur a bubbling story. Unnamed sources are one thing. Uh, we've used unnamed sources. Sometimes you've got people in a corporation, in a government, some kind of organization, and if they use their name, well, they'd be fired, and therefore they would never talk to you. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with an unnamed source, but you've got to be ready to stand by it. You've got to do, do your best to corroborate it from other sources, even if they're unnamed. You've got to be confident in it. Now, this CBC story, um, they say they, the CBC says they have not seen the emails themselves. They have just heard been told by people in the premier's office, in the government, that they have seen emails. I don't know. Um, I, Dave, if you came in and you presented that story to us, and that was our sources, we've talked to people who have seen emails, I'd be pretty nervous about publishing I'd, I'd want to see a copy of it. I'd want to see and a copy. Uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that, that uh, signifier is saying CBC hasn't seen the emails only came in the second day after the story was published. That, that was not in the original. That was story. not in the original story. So yeah, uh, you better trust your sources to be right on this one. Yeah. So this, Nigel, is not to say the story is incorrect. We don't know yet. There's an allegation made by the CBC on maybe they're correct, but it's it's definitely not rock solid, at least at this time. Um, both the premier's office and the CBC are doubling down. Both, I suppose both could be right that someone went rogue in the office and the, Smith and the higher-ups didn't know, maybe. I, I suppose they could both be right, but uh, public services investigated say they didn't find anything. The prosecutor's office, which is quite independent, look, they say they didn't find anything. Uh, how much risk is there for Smith here? 
because the story keeps bubbling, even if some of the stuff isn't very related. They are saying, you know, hey, we have emails, uh, you know, a, a letter from uh, Ezra Levant to the rebel, to chief of staff, to Smith saying, you know, here's ways you could look at um, uh, pardoning people. I don't think that's news. I'm not sure how, uh, I think they're, maybe they smell blood in the water and they're trying to gin things up a bit more. Is there a real story here, you think? I suspect that in the end there isn't, but what I mean, what we know is that she, you described how she said, yes, this is something we should look at. It was of interest to people who were likely to support her. So she would ask, once she became premier, all right, what can we do? Now, at that point, it becomes a matter of interpretation. If you don't like Danielle Smith, the very fact that you ask that question becomes evidence of interference. If you do like Danielle Smith, then you would accept what her, uh, what the press secretary for the, uh, the premier's office said, which was that after taking office, the premier and her staff had several discussions with the Minister of Justice and Justice Department Public Service requesting an explanation of what policy options were. Happens to be a justice matter. If you've got a policy on pipelines, you would probably have a similar kind of a discussion with the officials who have the details. What are our policy options? So uh, for me, so much will depend upon what, if anything, the CBC is ever able to put on the table and say, well, here is the email that our source saw, and it depends entirely on what it says. I would be very surprised. I would be extremely surprised if they have anything that comes remotely close in tone or tenor to what was going on in the federal government with SNC-Lavalin, for example. I... Um... I have noticed, though, the, the Premier's office is couching its language, careful not to say no emails exist. They're saying none could be found and we're not aware of any. You know, someone, it is possible someone could have sent something inappropriate. But again, we've not seen the email. This is CBC saying we talked to a guy who says they saw the email. And again, not to say that that email doesn't exist and the source is incredible, but... It's, it's not very solid, but the, the Premier's office is being careful to say it, well, not that it didn't be. happen. Well, of course they, they should be. I mean, it would be very foolish to... Yeah. But, uh, I mean, what was this, somebody's private email? We, we don't know. Well, also, yeah, let's you, talk about... You'd be pretty silly as a, uh, you know, a Daniel Smith staffer to use your official email for yeah. something like that. Yeah. Let's talk about what interference is because I, I, I suppose reasonable people could probably draw different conclusions about this. I, I would see interference as involving yourself in specific cases. Um, you know, let's say uh, Arthur Pulowski, um, he's one of the more prominent cases out there. You know, if the premier's office was interfering with the, the solicitor general and the prosecutor saying drop charges against Arthur Pulowski, that could pro reasonably be seen as interference. If it was a broader directive to say, okay, well, we think pretty much all of these charges during COVID lockdowns and mandates and all these things were unreasonable, we don't think that we should be proceeding with this because it was unjust to begin with, and it's a blanket policy and not individuals, I wouldn't see that as interference. I'd, I'd, I'd see that as exercising the discretion of the Solicitor General to target certain kinds of prosecutions and others. Justice has been done in many jurisdictions before. Quebec did it with abortion. They didn't intervene necessarily in specific cases, but they said, the Quebec, Quebec Solicitor General in the 60s or 70s said, we're just not prosecuting. We're just not prosecuting on abortion restrictions anymore, even though it's against federal law. BC did the same thing with small possession of cannabis. They just didn't do it. They didn't say, Mark Emery should be lot off. They just said, we're not prosecuting anyone. Although he still got charged because he was not small amounts. He was... He was selling and paying GST on it. Um, I, I, think, I think the difference there, Derek, is you're talking about future problems. I mean, what, what you're saying that you wouldn't consider interference is Daniel Smith saying, okay, let's go back and drop all these past charges. 
Mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a bit of difference between saying, okay, don't charge anybody with COVID stuff going forward now to saying, let's drop all the COVID stuff that's already before the courts. There's a difference, but I want your take on if you would think that'd be interference. If the I, premier, I do, yes, absolutely. You think it'd be interference to say absolutely. all COVID stuff? But, but well, she's clearly has done that. Um, she's made no secret about that. That's been open. She said it with us. She yeah. said it in others with interviews. There is no secret that she has said she wants, uh, will ex explore, and I think the implication being she would support dropping existing charges against people from the COVID era. You think that was interference? Well, she did, She said she'd explore it, and that appears, according to the CBC if, story, if, what if she, she did. If she actively did it or directed it. Yeah, I think that's interference. Okay. All right. Uh, Nigel, I want uh, well, your take. Because the charges have already been laid. Uh, yeah. If she says, but they were okay, laid no, more, no more charges in the future, then yeah. I think you're good. But, but. but they, those charges were laid under one set of directives – under the Solicitor General and the Premier at, at a former time, which is funny because the Solicitor General now was the health minister <laughs> during all of this. It's all very incestuous. Um, but it, it was, for all intents and purposes, a different government, even though there's a significant overlap between them. It was a different government, and governments are able to set the uh, priorities of prosecutions. Uh, not, Nigel, I want your take on, do you think that would const would it constitute interference to give a broad directive that these charges and cases be dropped uh, against people who shirked uh, COVID restrictions and mandates. Yeah, well, I'm, I must disagree with you slightly, Dave, on that. That's just, all right. I, well, we disagree lots, folks. But well, I'm anyway, not coming back next week, then. And, uh, but, you know, uh, a lot of people thought that those things were unjust. So you put somebody in, uh, in a position where they can address injustices. I don't have a problem with that. Um, there are other reasons, by the way, why, why cases can be dropped. Sometimes they can just time out. And we have an incredibly busy court system at the moment where people who I think a lot of us would like to see go through the process and have the matter resolved just eventually fall off the edge and the case is dismissed. That is another way. If... Uh, if, if that can happen to somebody who's got a drug charge, I'm quite happy to see it happen intentionally with somebody who is charged under a law that I personally think was obsessive and uh, poorly conceived. I think we're going to have to ultimately wait and see if the CBC can produce the email between Smith's office and a prosecutor. If they can provide that, well, then we'll have to judge it on its merits. And you know, if it was some fart catcher intern... Probably not as serious. If it was the chief of staff, very serious. So I, I, I think we're, um, I, I, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see. Can CBC produce the email? And I'm sure they're frantically trying to get it right now, because uh, that'll make their case for them if they do. If they can't find it, it's CBC said, said Smith said. All right. Um, actually, we're gonna change up the planned order here. We're gonna go straight to uh, story around uh, fundraising in Alberta, UCP and uh, an NDP um, for, s since not that long after the last provincial election in spring 2019, uh, the UCP under Kenny has been trailing the NDP in fundraising, sometimes quite badly, um, probably an indication of an upset party membership. Uh, and that gap between the parties was pretty big. That gap has now, uh, well, essentially disappeared um, now, Smith has only been the leader of the party more or less for the fourth quarter of 2022, but uh, the party overall matched the NDP in fundraising for um, for 2022 at $7 million each. If you include money raised for the leadership campaigns, uh, the UCB actually raised $10.8 million, but that money can't be put towards a general election. It's It's all complicated. So depending on how you look at it, the UCP has either closed the gap and tied the NDP or exceeded it, depending on which metrics you're looking at. Uh, Dave, break it down a bit further. Uh, I know you've looked at, looked at the numbers. Uh, tell us how, how this has changed over uh, the, the last while uh, and how the UCP closed that gap. Well, I became a journalist, uh, Derek, because I hate math. So uh, I'm going to have to refer to my my cheat sheet here. Uh, you're quite right in saying that ever since the last election, uh, uh, Rachel Notley has been leading uh, uh, 
quarterly fundraising, especially apparent during the uh, Jason Kenney uh, uh, when he was uh, in charge. Uh, basically, they both got seven million dollars uh, to play with uh, before the May election. Uh, the UCP raised three point two million in the last quarter, which is an incredible amount. Uh, you know, nearly half of that seven million, and that was their best month since the uh, the previous election in uh, 2019. Uh, interestingly, uh, on January 31st, both parties raised $265,000. Uh, so, uh, I guess there's uh, uh, some year-end... Uh, Do you have numbers on how the NDP did in that last quarter of 2022 when the UCP you know, had, had Smith, new leadership, and uh, seemingly a revival in their fundraising numbers? Yeah, yeah. to be honest, I don't. Uh, the, the only one I've got is the UCP, uh, three point two million in the last quarter. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's, that's a lar- half of, what, of the yeah, seven million they raised here, all done in one quarter. That's a large chunk of money. So basically, for the campaign, uh, uh, both uh, parties are well funded, uh, and, and everything's to play for at the moment. The latest uh, opinion polls uh, that are taken uh, mid December have the NDP at thirty eight percent, the UCP at thirty two percent. Uh, six points behind, but there's a whopping 25% undecided. Uh, so that's where the obviously the election will be won and lost. And uh, uh, at this moment, it's all to play for, and uh, money will be no object. Uh, so, Nigel, uh, fundraising is not necessarily a good barometer of general public opinion, but it is a pretty reliable barometer of opinion within parties. And so it wouldn't be... Mu- I don't think it's a stretch to say that the unpopularity of Jason Kenney among <coughs> UCP members, among UCP supporters, was you know driving the big reason why UCP fundraising was lagging so far beyond uh, behind the NDP for almost his entire premiership. Um, these numbers have come rocketing back now in the fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, that's the only quarter for which Smith is leader, and it's also coming after the leadership election where a lot of the bigger donors are all tapped out. They're not allowed to donate anymore, but they still uh, set a record in that quarter. Do um, you think this would be a sign then of perhaps the UCP membership, the UCP supporter and donor base, uh, maybe showing at least a brief glimmer of being un- a united, united conservative party? I don't think they'll ever be united, United, but that certainly is a very strong indication of support. You don't give money to causes or parties that you don't believe in. And I think that's really the, what do these, there's, there's one number that we don't have, and that's what the average contribution is to each. Uh, yeah, because these were unofficial numbers, self-reported yeah. by the parties. This is not uh, the breakdown from elections. Canada. The breakdown's not till March. Yeah, no. That when, when we have that number, admittedly it's going to be getting quite close to the event, but when we have that number, we really see how that, uh, that, that plays out. I, I do recall, uh, you know, there was a time when the Liberal Party was raising massive amounts of money, but it was all, this is the time when corporate donations were allowed. And so they had kind of 12,000 lawyers in Toronto and, 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 and Montreal who were supporting the party. Meanwhile, the... Um, uh, this would be in the Canadian Alliance days, you had 150,000 people all given $100 each. 150,000 votes, 12,000 votes. What's it going to be here? We won't know until March, apparently. But it, just the just the trajectory of this from disinterest under the, in the nine months during which uh, Jason Kenney was leading the party and was thoroughly rejected by the party, uh, to the last quarter, when you have a new premier, everybody gets hopeful and says, "All right, okay, if that's how it's going to be, here's my check," and away it goes. So I think if I were if I were in the uh, the uh, United Conservative Party, I would take those numbers and receive them with great enthusiasm and hope. Now I want to talk about the NDP a bit more here. Because I think they have a lot to be happy about as well. They had a record quarter. Uh, it may have been a record year as well. Um, you know, during their term in government, it was pretty widely known that if you were a staffer at the legislature, the premier's office, anything like that, you were expected to max out your donations. Not everyone did, but 
most people did. It was understood that part of your salary was taxed back to the party because you owe the party your job. You are expected to donate the maximum. And that was a significant portion of the NDP's fundraising haul. Now, they don't have that to rely on anymore. They've got some staffers at the legislature, but opposition staffers are paid a pale uh, reflection of what government staffers are. Uh, you got junior government staffers clearing over 100, and you'll have like the top opposition staffer, chief of staff, making 800. So they don't have quite this, those disposable salaries to go with. This shows me that the NDP has established a significant fundraising base in Alberta. They're getting, they're raising significant money. And this is outside of the political action committee PACs that both UCP have allied with them and the NDP have allied with them. You know, the unions and businesses find ways to get their money around one way or another. But uh, for the party proper, the NDP is, uh, is raising substantial sums of cash. Uh, what do you think you could chalk that up to, uh, Dave? Well, if you just look at the polls, uh, 38 percent, that's a good chunk of support uh, in the province. Uh, if you go into the cesspool of Twitter on any any night, uh, the hatred is out there for Daniel Smith. Uh, hatred is out there, you know, uh, for the UCP party uh, as a whole. And it's, uh, you know, the NDP, they were in power. So they, they've, they've got a good solid base of support in the province. They do. And those are the people that are that are, are, are donating the money, uh, as Nigel said. Uh, you know, some, some of them will just be hundred dollars from NDP supporters. You know, we don't want to see another year a UCP four years. Look at the mess they made of the pandemic and healthcare and and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, you you just can't discount the NDP, no, in any way, shape, or form. Don't discount it, but there were reasons why people would have stopped supporting the UCP during 2022. There are also reasons now. I say, okay, I still, I still think I prefer the UCP to what I remember of the of the NDP. We all go through a little bit of second thought on this. The, kind of the NDP is now consistently raising large amounts of cash, and they're doing so without being in government, where they are able to unofficially tax the political staffers in the government kicking back parts of their salary. This is going to be overwhelmingly support from people who just support the NDP. Um, this is pretty well without precedent in Alberta. The NDP is in election mode. They are. Every single day, Rachel Notley's putting out uh, some press release complaining about something that the UCP has done. Uh, within, uh, within minutes of every UCP announcement, there's an NDP press conference to follow uh, with their... Uh, with their reaction. So they've already got their election game face on and they're pushing their, their agenda proactively, uh, you know, and it's getting in, in some newspapers and it's getting more coverage than they normally would. Well, uh, before we move on, let's just talk quickly about uh, Drew Barnes. He is the independent MLA from Cypress, Massachusetts. Now he was first elected under the Wild Rose banner in 2012, re-elected Wild Rose 2015, and then re-elected under the UCP banner in 2019. Uh, since that time, he became kind of a thorn in the side of Jason Kenney. Uh, never called for him to resign or anything uh, for during most of that time. Uh, but, you know, would talk about Kenney's fair deal stuff being too limp. Uh, even talked about possible independence, you know, pretty controversial if you're a sitting member of a governing party. Uh, took issue with a lot of, you know, lockdown and mandate things. And uh, finally, Kenny just kicked him out when Todd Lowen spoke up and said Kenny should step down as leader. He's been sitting as an independent MLA since. Um, Todd Lowen has since returned to the UCP, and his, and his transgression was much greater. He called on the leader, the premier at the time, Jason Kenny, to resign. Uh, but uh, Barnes has remained independent. Now, uh, he issued a statement, uh, I think, yesterday saying he is not seeking the UCP nomination. Um, now, I think most people have interpreted that as he's not running in the next election. I didn't technically say he's not running in the next election. He says he's not running for the UCP nomination. And at the same time, he praised Danielle Smith uh, quite strongly. So with you, Nigel. Um, why do you think he's not going to run for the UCP nomination? And do you think there's a chance he takes a crack at this as an independent? He may well um, have just had enough of the whole thing. No, I haven't spoken to him. I haven't asked him that question. But how many, he's already, what did you say, independent, Wild Rose, UCP, you're running out of parties. 
going back as an independent again, I, I doubt that that would be a successful venture, given that there's the momentum of a new leader. Um, seems unlikely, uh, but you know he's he's done he's done his time in the in, in the legislature. He may well have other interests that he wants to pursue. Yeah. I, I uh, face I, value on that. I had a brief chat with uh, Drew today. Uh, yeah. uh, he basically said, "This isn't what I signed up for 11 years ago." Uh, he's put in a decade in politics, uh, as you say, Nigel. He's worked his way through uh, mm -hmm. through many parties. Uh, his only opportunity is to run as an independent. Alberta doesn't elect independent uh, people. Uh, I suppose he could run for the uh, the Wild Rose Independence Party. Uh, but I don't think he'd have much chance down there. So I think, uh, you know, Drew will, Drew will uh, ride off into the sunset and take care of some other stuff. Well, there you go. A newsman who actually picks up the phone and asks the subject, what are you going to do? We're going to talk about the news in a second. Dave Naylor, we salute you. I'd, I'd be doubtful he, he goes independent. The last independent MLA elected in Alberta was circa 1982. Gordon Kessler. Uh, no, that was a by-election, and by he was Western Canada Concept. Um, no, it was uh, Ray Speaker. Ray Speaker, oh. was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was the last uh, independent elected in Alberta. And this was a time before there were televised leaders' debates. You just elected your MLA, and whoever had the most MLAs was, was the premier. That was the way it was. And so the actual MLA counted for something. It had a bit more of a voice. It wasn't as dominated by the leader. Uh, and Ray Speaker had been an MLA for decades before that with the Social Credit Party. He had been the deputy premier. He had been a finance minister. He had been, after Ernest Benning, the number two man in Alberta and was a rural riding. And he got elected in, I think, 1982 or so. It's not happened since independents do not get elected in Alberta, particularly the provincial level. There's been a few very rare cases at the federal level. Um, David, uh, there was a liberal MP from Edmonton who made it uh, as an independent once. Uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's extraordinarily rare. I, I can't imagine he'd, he'd, uh, he'd likely do it. So uh, and that's, that being a safe uh, UCP riding, whoever wins that UCP nomination is likely to take it on. And, and full disclosure, since we're talking about this, uh, former Vice President of Operations at the Western Center, James Finkbeiner, uh, resigned from his position here to actually run in that uh, that riding, which is in his hometown. Uh, so full disclosure, that we, we know people involved in this. Maybe that's one reason we know so much about it. Uh, okay. Well, let's <clears throat> speaking of reporters picking up the phone and doing their job, Post Media, the biggest newspaper company in Canada, uh, if you can even call it Canada, the biggest in Canada, but they're not Canadian. They're actually owned by the Chatham Wealth Management uh, Group out of New Jersey. It's more or less a New York, it's owned by, New, uh, by money guys in New York. That's who owns most of the newspapers in Canada. And that's the National Post, the Calgary Herald, <clears throat> Vancouver Sun, Regina Leader Post, uh, Winnipeg Free Press, Ottawa Citizen, uh, tons of stuff, and uh, like many, many, many in between. They're supposed to be the big boy. Now, they're getting gargantuan piles of money from the federal government every year from the media bailout subsidy. We don't know the exact amount because they won't tell us. They classify it as a tax thing, so we don't actually really get to know. But uh, Post Media has announced the layoff of 11% of their editorial workforce. Um, both of you guys are, uh, not meaning to date you, but you, two of you are longstanding veterans in the media industry. Um, how is it possible that you know, subsidies come in from the federal government, which equal between probably 33 to 44% of how much they spend every year, isn't enough to keep these guys propped up at this point? So you, you mentioned the, the New York hedge funds, they want their money. And you've got to keep shoveling, uh, shoveling the money to them. Uh, Post Media is just a shambles at the moment. Uh, they've canceled their Monday papers for for the Vancouver Province Sun, Herald Journal. Uh, no more Monday product. Uh, nobody works in the news. I think we've got the biggest newsroom uh, uh, in the province, certainly. Actually, among written journalism, although we're on video right now, most of what we do is written. I could be mistaken. I believe we are the only newsroom exactly. in Alberta. Uh, they're the they're not back in the newsroom because they're selling their buildings. They need more money. Uh, so the, yeah, they, they announced yesterday uh, Jerry Knott, the uh, 
one of the top guys there, announced 11% mm-hmm. uh, slashbacks. Says it's going to affect every every uh, paper in the chain. But then I think c- quite cruelly, they didn't say who was going to go. Uh, they said, oh, you know, we'll tell you in a couple of days who's who's, well, who's going to be laid off. Which is good. You should ask for volunteers. Yeah, but right? this, this, you know, that, that uh, sort of Damocles hanging over your head is... Is 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 a bit unfair. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, lots of post media people they're uh, sitting with their heads down uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, morale, which was already low, uh, uh, plummeted even further. Uh, you know, I, you just wonder. You know, the I, the Calgary Sun Sports Department has three people in it: one to one to cover Flames, one for Stampeders and uh, want to do the desking and, and layout and all that sort of stuff. How can you cover a city of Calgary with three people? That's insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. I don't know how many more former Post Media employees we can hire at the Western Standard. We've taken on a lot. We're uh, sort of the refuge for former Post Media and Sun employees. Uh, Nigel, you kind of, you know, your, your time at the Herald was probably kind of at the end of its high times as, as a big serious and profitable business. Um, I, I don't know. What do you think this is going to do uh, to their to their newsrooms? There's less people, right. but... Uh, I We've mean, got 650 staff coast to coast, apparently. 11% of them are going to go. Well, uh, what's left for those people? That, uh, and I noticed, by the way, that people uh, who are earning more than $60,000 are expected to uh, accept a pay cut. So... Yeah. You know that's not huge money. It's uh, it's uh, it's going to be very hard to keep people motivated. This is a very sad day. Uh, I mean, it would be possible to because the Western Standard is a bustling place, going somewhere, doing things, getting stories out. You think, hey, we rock, and those guys have just uh, have just spoiled their 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 whole credibility with some bad reporting or some uh, biased reporting, ho, ho, ho. I don't feel like that because there's a lot of good people in those organizations, Mm -hmm. people who know how to write a story, people who know how to dig. And the truth of the matter is that there just is not the budget to let them do what they know how to do. So for everyone who is a crazy little wokester, there's somebody, some old stager there who has been pulling his weight and more for all these years, and they're either going to work for less or work not at all. This is not a victory for for anybody, uh, I, and I feel really sad about it. Uh, and I have noticed that I'm sure you guys have seen it too. Previous rounds of playoffs at the at Post Media. <laughs> this is obviously far from the first. There's, yep. uh, no, I, no, I, no. I can't even number it at this point. Um, not universally, but generally, they're often letting go a lot of the veterans, a lot of the best guys in the business, because they tend to be more expensive. You yeah, know, exactly. uh, like anywhere, sure. the guys more exp- uh, the more experienced guys, the guys disproportionately better at their job, going to be more experienced than the kid just out of J school. Not always the case, but often is. And you know, and and it's just leaving these things as skeletons. Uh, you know, here we try to have a pretty good mix of. You know, seasoned veterans like you guys and kids fresh out of journalism school or people who don't know journalism and we're going to train them up. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of these things. But, uh, you know, their newsrooms are increasingly filled with recent J school graduates who uh, are, are being all thoughts, all, all sorts of nonsense about journalism. And I, I feel like if that's the route they go in this round of layoffs, again, further compounding that problem they're only going to move further and further away from a lot of their readerships and continue to lose market share. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a, a big part of this, a whole part of this, really is the uh, fact that the business model that sustained print newspapers for so many decades has been completely undermined by the internet. First thing to go were the real estate ads, followed by the uh, motor car ads, followed by the flyers, one by one, all of the big sources of revenue. Actually, the first one to go was the legal ads. You know the career placements and, mm. and so on. Um, so bit by bit, the like when I was running newspapers, I, I, I seem to recall that uh, half of our half of our um, uh, revenue 
came from the local advertising and about a about 15% of it from what we refer to as national advertising and then 15% from classified advertising. Well, okay, so the classifieds went to Kijiji and, and its imitators. The, uh, the legal ads went to the websites, the career websites, and by and by people were less, in, it, it compounded. It was less in the paper, so people were less inclined to buy it. Sub uh, subscriptions went down, not the place to choose to advertise anymore, and somebody else was delivering the flyers. You know, I mean, it was just a, it just couldn't last. And now, and now, they, now they're reduced to begging Justin Trudeau on their knees for Bill C-18 to shake down Google and Facebook well, and hand them know, more money. The Alberta properties, uh, the Edmonton Journal, Sun, Herald, and uh, uh, Calgary Sun, they used to be the jewels of, of Crown, of Post Media. They would make tens of millions of dollars a year. And the, the fall, you know, the fall from that, uh, to the height of it to what it is now is it's being staggering. Oh, it is. I, I don't know what the circulation is now, but it's a fraction of what it would have been. Yeah. Yeah. People just don't buy paper newspapers no. anymore. No. All right, well, we're going to wrap it up there. Nigel, Dave, yeah. thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. I thank all of you for joining us today. Remember, if you're not yet a member of the Western Standard, you should be. Uh, if you go to westernstandard.news, click on membership. It's only $10 a year, sorry, uh, $10 a month or $100 a year, and that'll give you full access through the paywall to get all Western Standard content. We're talking right now about the trouble in the media and news business. Well, the only reason we're able to continue doing what we're doing is because people like you put their money where their mouth is and support independent media we refuse to take a penny of the federal government's media bailout. We can't do it unless you support us. So uh, become a member today. Guarantee you're going to love it. Thank you very much for joining me today. God bless. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada, and more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited